Turn your Bibles. We are in the book of James. Book of James. And as you're turning there, a few more riddles. They might even be called dad jokes. It's a question. Did Eve ever have a date with Adam? No, never a date, just an apple. What excuse, what excuse did Adam give his children about why they no longer lived in Eden? Your mother ate us out of house and home. All right, last one, Brother Harley. This one's yours. Who was the first tennis player listed in the Bible? That would be Joseph, because he served in Pharaoh's court. Amen. It's a good thing it's time to preach. Amen. Well, last week, we began a study in some of the struggles that we all face, and especially for dads. It's been said, being a dad brings out the best in us and also the worst in us. With that being said, this is a message of encouragement. I want to make sure we understand that. It's easy when, when we hear these type of messages to to see where all of our failures were, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of this message is to encourage all of us. God does not expect us to be perfect. Amen? He understands who we are. He understands that we are sinners. We're still wrapped in our flesh in this sinful world, but He does want us to be the best that we can be in Him. Amen? That's God's desire for us. So this morning, let's pick up in James chapter 1, starting at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower uh, falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away, in his pursuits. Verse 12, Blessed the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that he might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, as we see in this passage, God is speaking to two specific groups of people. In verse 2, he's speaking to those who are going through trials. And then we see in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempting. He's talking about those who are experiencing temptation. And what's the difference? Well, as we looked last week, Trials are designed to bring out the best in us. God will allow trials in our life to bring out the best in us, to test our faith, to work our faith, to to chisel away those things that we need to get rid of in our life. But temptations are the opposite. They are designed by the enemy to bring out the worst in us. And this morning we're going to focus on that slippery slope of temptation. Temptation always comes with that certain fun factor. 
Although very alluring, we need to understand that that fun factor is only temporary. It does not last. So let's continue to look at some of those areas of temptations, again, that are designed to bring out the worst in us. Amen? First area is that of material possessions. And that's the temptation to provide things instead of ourselves to our family, to let toys replace our time. There are absolutely very few things more important to our children than simply being there for them. Amen? Simply being there for them. We need the wisdom to understand the difference between providing for our family's needs and working extra to provide for their wants. Amen? We have a generation of spoiled kids. Amen? And it's our fault. And I'm just as guilty as you are. You know, we want to give our kids the things that we never had. And in turn, what we've done is we've spoiled a generation. Amen? We need to understand that, that we, our obligation is to provide for their needs, not necessarily for their wants. Amen? Our time and overtime, they're going to forget all those things that we ever bought them. Amen? But they will always remember all those times when you weren't there for them. Second area of temptation is the area of emotional demands. Emotional demands. That's when we are tempted to give our job our best, our career, the workplace. And what happens? Our family gets what's left. And when that's the case, that simply means, I can word it another way, our family gets less of us. Amen? If we give our very best, to our jobs, our careers, that means our family gets less of us. They get what's left. Work is demanding. There's no doubt about it. It's demanding in just about every area, every aspect of our life. It demands our creativity. It, it demands our enthusiasm. It demands our ideas. It demands and it demands and on and on and on. That's just a reality of work. But at the end of the day, our family suffers when we give them our leftovers. Amen? The ones that we love the most, we end up giving our leftovers. We have to be very careful not to overcommit ourselves to people, to things, to hobbies, different things. We need to be very careful. That's when we hurt the ones that we love the most. Amen? We need to understand that it's okay to say no from time to time. Amen? Sometimes, you know, we get invited here or there, and, and sometimes we, we have to say no. We have family obligations at times. And it's okay. We need to understand that. That's even, that even applies on a Sunday morning. Amen? If you have a family emergency, if you have something that you need to deal with your children about, and you're sitting there watching the clock, I'm going to be late to church. Listen. God knows where you need to be. We will understand. This church will understand if you need to take care of a family emergency first. Amen? You never want your children to believe, well, well, you're putting church ahead of me. The only thing that we put ahead of our family is God Himself. Amen? And we need to understand that. So sometimes we have to learn to say no. Third area is the area of our words. Verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It'd be great if we acted that way, amen. Problem is we most of the time we act the opposite. We are swift to speak, slow to hear, and quick to wrath, quick to correct. Ephesians six four. We need to understand this verse, understand what it means. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to, to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Not to provoke our children under wrath. There's a lot of ways we can do that. One way is to discipline out of anger. Listen, discipline out of anger never 
works. Amen. Remember what I said, being a, being a dad or being a parent brings out the best in us? That's the part when it brings out the worst in us. When we, when we try to correct our children out of anger, discipline out of anger never works. Something else that never works is rules without a relationship. Now, I'm not talking about that phenomenon today where kids actually call their parents by their first name. That's something I do not like. Amen? It's a, it's a sign of disrespect. I don't mean that you are to be your children's best friend. Absolutely not. You are their parent. Amen? You are their parent, not their best friend. And you need to have that parent-child relationship before you can have rules. And you have to build upon that relationship. Because if you lay down rules and it's just because I said so, it doesn't work. What happens when we do that? Our children will tune us out and when they tune us out, that means they're going to tune the world in. Amen? They're going to look to the world to find all the answers to all their questions. Fourth area. Fourth area is unrealistic expectations. What does that mean? Well, that's the temptation to be perfect and also to expect perfection in others. And that can also mean our children. Right? Sometimes we're too hard on our kids. Other times we're not hard enough. But unrealistic expectations, that's for us. This is something I struggle with. I'm a perfectionist. Sometimes that's a blessing. Other times it's a curse. You know, my kids were little. A lot of times we'd be playing out in the backyard and, and I'd be looking at the things they were doing wrong instead of just having fun. No, bat this way, or swing the bat that way, or, or throw the ball this way. It can be a curse. So how do you know if this is you? A couple quick questions. You don't answer them out loud, you just answer them to yourself. Do you demand the best at all times and in all things and all situations? Do you get upset when things don't go the way you plan them and arrange them? As soon as something goes wrong in that, in that planning stage... You get upset. Do you get disappointed in others for their lack of quality in what they are doing? Do you get disappointed in others for being average? And does being average bother you? If this is you, let me let me put it into perspective. Amen? Something that, that I'm preaching to myself as well. To be a Hall of Fame baseball player... Everyone would, would agree it's a very prestigious honor, isn't it? To be enshrined in the Hall of Fame for baseball. Now, if you were a 333 batter, okay, if you were in baseball in the major leagues and your lifetime batting average was 333, you would be well on your way to Canton, Ohio, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. You know what that means? You know what you would have to do to bat 333? That means you would have to get a hit one out of every three at bats. But let me put it this way. That also means that you failed every two out of three at bats. Amen? Puts it in a little better perspective, doesn't it? You can be a Hall of Fame baseball player by failing two out of every three at bats. And what this message is for us, dads and moms, it's okay if we fail sometimes. Amen? As long as we accept it and we learn from it. Some of the most successful people in the world, they're the ones that have failed the most. Amen? It's okay to mess up. It's okay to fail as long as we learn from it. We have to accept failure from time to time as long as we grow from it. As long as we learn from it. That's the fourth area. Unrealistic expectation. Number five. Sexual temptation. Now things are getting real, men. This is a temptation to find intimate satisfaction outside of marriage. Men? I can tell you right now I've counseled many married couples. And I've heard a lot of rationalizations, you can call them excuses if you want to, it's 
pretty close. A lot of excuses, a lot of rational, rationalizations as to why they did what they did. I hear, well, you know, God knew what I was going through and, and he sent her for me to talk to. Or I'll hear, if, if God didn't want me to share all of my, my problems, he wouldn't have sent such a, a guy with, that was such a good listener. God knew exactly what I needed in my life. These are some of the things that I hear. And what do I do? I take them to verse 13. What does God say here? Plain and simple. God does not tempt. Let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God did not send those people into their lives. Amen? Plain and simple. We need to understand that. Look at verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's an interesting word that God uses here in, in James 1, the word entice. It's not used very often in, in, in all of Scripture, but this word entice literally means to draw into harm's way by use of bait. That's what it literally means, to be drawn into harm's way by use of bait. Any fishermen out there? Anybody ever been fishing? When you go fishing, what do you put on the end of your hook? You put bait, or at the end of the line you use a lure, right? One or the other. You either use bait or you use lure. And you use them to do what? You use them to entice the fish. To lure them into harm's way so that you can what? Catch them. That's what fishing is all about. That's what that word entice is all about. To draw into harm's way by use of bait. And sexual temptation is exactly the same. You've been enticed and lured by your own lusts. You ignore all the warning signs. You ignore all the consequences. You rationalize why this is such a good thing. You exaggerate in your mind about how awful your marriage life is. You're drawn into this new person who's, who's just great. That person who listens to you all the time. Who, who understands the problems that you're going through. Bottom line, you have been enticed. Plain and simple. That's how it works. That's exactly how it goes down. Now look at verse 15. Then when desire has conceived, when you give in to that temptation, it gives birth to what? Sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Lust never gives birth to joy. Lust only gives birth to to sin. Here's reality. I can tell you through all the years of pastoring, all the years of listening to, to broken relationships, to marriages that have fallen apart, every person involved in, the, in an affair always, in my experience, 100% of the time, always end up unhappy and unfulfilled. That's the end result. Why? Because that fun factor always runs out. That fun factor always, always runs out of what's left. They're left trying to, to, to put back their broken life. Put back all the pieces. They're left shattered and broken. Trying to put the puzzle of their life back together. We always hear, you know, the, the grass looks greener on the other side. We always hear that, doesn't it? Well, listen, if you took the time to water and care for your own grass once in a while, it would be just as green or more green than the other side. Amen. Listen, marriage is the hardest work that you will undertake. But it's also the most rewarding. 
And yes, I did say work. Everybody catch that? Marriage is work. You have to work at it every single day. Don't tell my wife. She knew that. But you do. You have to work at it every single day. You have to water your grass every day. Amen? Marriage has such a special place in God's heart. We look in Scripture. We need to understand that that marriage was instituted by God even before the church. God instituted marriage even before He instituted the church. That's how special of a place that marriage has in God's heart. What else did God do about marriage that, that tells us marriage is special to Him? God also uses marriage as an analogy to let us understand that relationship that the believer has with Jesus Christ, doesn't He? The Bible calls Christ the what? The bridegroom. He's the groom. And we are the bride of Christ. That's how special the marriage covenant is to God. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives. Is that a suggestion? That's a commandment. Amen? Underline that in your Bible. It says, husbands, you are to love your wives. That's a commandment of God. How so? How are you to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church? And what did he do for his church? He gave himself to her. Amen? Husbands, that's a question. Is, that, is this the kind of love that you have given to your wife? A love that says, I will die for you. I will lay down my life for you. I will sacrifice all that I am for you. Because that's the kind of love that Christ has for you and I. We're the church. We're the ones that He loves that much. Husbands, do you love your wives? So deep and to the point that it's compared to the way that Jesus loves us. It's a great love, isn't it? A love that made Him stretch out His arms so that nails could be driven through. A love that gave His life in exchange for ours. Husbands, love your wives. Amen.